Good evening. I trust everyone is keeping well in these strange times. Uh, I'd like to look at a couple of questions this evening. Um, I'm sure that at this moment in time, for the last few months, we've all had questions that we have asked. We haven't always had the answers. Um, I don't know when we will fully get the answers, but I suppose as human beings, we're quite inquisitive. We always like to ask things. Um, some of us like asking questions, but we don't always like being asked a question. I'm sure we've all experienced, either by asking or being asked, questions like, why? Why? You know, as a child or children say it to us, or have said it to us, you know, why? Why this? Why that? Or, of course, the, the one that always makes people laugh, and if you go on a journey with the kids, are we there yet? I mean, but, but the simplest request to do something can always be responded to by a question, which again is mostly why. But some questions, they make us feel uncomfortable because we know the person asking won't like the honest answer if we provide it. And other questions give us the opportunity to gain favour with whoever is asking. I would like to look at two pointed questions that are very personal, which the Lord Jesus put to two very different classes of people uh, in the Bible. First, he put it to his friends, his disciples, and later to his enemies, the Pharisees. And by enemies, I mean those who hated him and despite his love for them. These two occasions are both found in the Gospel of Matthew. The first in chapter 16, verses 13 and 15, and the second in chapter 22, verses, 20, sorry, verses 41 and 42. In chapter 16, he directed his question to his disciples. They had been with him for three and a half years and had heard him, his preaching and witnessed his miracles. They, more than anyone, should be able to answer him correctly. Matthew wrote, When Jesus came into the course of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? But let's look at Christ's personal question to the Pharisees. The other question is very similar, but it was put in a different way. This time it was posed to the Pharisees, who were always trying to find an occasion against him. It is found again in Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 and 42. Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? In the background to this, the Lord had been speaking to the people in parables, and the Pharisees, after hearing him, discussed among themselves how they could entangle him in his talk. They could not put a finger at his life, they could not point a finger at his life. They sent some of the people with her audience to him with a politically loaded question regarding paying tribute to Caesar. Following that, the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, came with their trick question, and then a lawyer asked, what is the greatest of all commandments? On each occasion, the Lord completely flowed them, and by his answers revealed his infinite wisdom and understanding. While the Pharisees were gathered together, he put them on a spot, and he asked them, What think ye of Christ? Or in other words, Messiah, whose son is he? The Pharisees thrived on the adulation of the people. They were looked upon as being holy, and consider themselves to be the custodians of the laws of Moses, the only ones qualified to interpret and teach it. They loved to stand in the synagogue and the street corners to offer up long, eloquent prayers to impress people. There were exceptions, though. Some Pharisees were secret disciples of Jesus, such as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, but generally they disliked him intensely because his life and teachings exposed their hypocrisy and undermined their authority. Eventually, they showed their hatred by having him crucified. The Pharisees were only concerned with keeping the letter of the law. For example, because they had not actually committed adultery or murdered anyone, they believed themselves innocent of those sins until Jesus showed them that obedience had to do with the heart. God is not impressed with outward appearances. He looks upon the heart. He weighs the motives. 
he sees the thoughts and imaginations of the mind. Secretly harboring lustful thoughts or hating somebody is equally as bad in the eyes of God as actually committing the offence. On one occasion, the Lord Jesus called them whited sepulchres, which looked beautiful and clean on the outside, but the inside reeks with a stench of death and corruption. It was to these Pharisees the Lord asked, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? There was so much confusion amongst the theologians of the day regarding Messiah and his deliverance of salvation. So much so that even some thought there may be two messiahs, for in the Old Testament two very different pictures of a messiah are portrayed. One being Messiah, the, re the reigning monarch, and the other is that of a suffering servant, as depicted in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. The Apostle Peter, in his first letter, wrote about the sufferings of the Christ and the glory that should follow. These Pharisees had their own preconceived ideas of the promised Messiah who was to come. For the past three and a half years, the Lord Jesus had presented them with irrefutable evidence. The miracles he performed had never been seen before in the history of the nation. He fulfilled every prophecy that pointed to his coming, but they were so full of prejudice against him, they refused to believe and accept him. And in their rejection, they actually fulfilled a prophecy Isaiah gave over 750 years previously, when he wrote, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. His question, What think ye of Christ, whose son is he, was straightforward. After all, they were the trained experts of the law. So without hesitation, they replied, he is the son of David. They could have quoted many Old Testament scriptures, for example, 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 13, where God through his prophet Nathan said to David, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of, of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Or they could have quoted Micah 5 2, which says, But thou, Bethlehem and Frata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. But they didn't quote any scripture at all. They simply said that Christ was the son of David, confident that. That was sufficient of a reply. But on hearing their answer, Jesus asked them another question, this time quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1, where David wrote, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The text in the original reads, The Lord, that's Jehovah, and Jehovah means the ever-existing one, which is, which was, and which is to come. Sometimes we struggle with understanding what that means, but we, we have to realize that when we look at scripture and we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not looking at man, we are looking at God. So therefore, he is the ever existing one which is, which was, and which is to come. And said unto my Lord, Adonai, which is another title of God, which occurs nearly 300 times in the Bible and means sovereign Lord or master. It is a plural title. Abraham was the first to use this in Genesis 15, verses 2 and 8. And Abraham said, Lord God, or Adonai Jehovah, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And in verse 8, and he said, Lord God, again, Adonai Jehovah, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So Jesus quoted this verse, which every Orthodox Jewish scholar acknowledges, refers to the Messiah, for only the Messiah could sit at the right hand of Jehovah God. And he asks, if, as you say, Messiah is David's son, then how could Messiah also be David's Lord? That's logical. Surely everyone would be able to see that it was. It was strange that David would call his son Adonai. But because of their prejudice against him, they would not answer him, although his answer is really very simple. As God, Messiah is David's Lord. He is Adonai Jehovah, 
but as man, Messiah is David's son. God is both God and man. In Revelation 22, verse 16, the Lord Jesus himself says, I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and the morning star. Despite the irrefutable evidence that was presented to them, they willfully and they deliberately rejected their Messiah. That personal question, if answered honestly and sincerely, would have resulted in their eternal salvation. For John wrote, He, that's Jesus, came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them give he power to become sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. However, their willful rejection was final. And Matthew tells us that no man was able to answer him a word. Neither did any man from that day on ask him any more questions. So let's now look at Christ's personal question to his disciples. And we see the difference. It's a similar question, but it was directed this time to his friends who were his disciples. The account is found in Matthew 16 between verses 13 and 20. Jesus had took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, which is about 120 miles from Jerusalem in the northern of Israel. This was Gentile territory, and the region was strongly identified with various religions. At one time, it was a centre for Baal worship, and also there were shrines there to the Greek god Pan, and Herod the Great had built a temple there in honour of Augustus Caesar. The Roman emperors were considered to be gods, and people were expected to worship them. So it is more than likely that this dialogue with his disciples took place within sight of Caesar's temple. Sorry, within Caesar's temple. The Lord asked them this question in two stages. First, he questioned them as to what the people thought of him. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? If someone asked us, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? We would think them strange to say that, say the least. Our reaction would be, well, who on earth does he think he is? He would be either be proud or even arrogant or perhaps a little demented. But Jesus had a perfectly good reason for asking them this question. It was plain that Jesus was no ordinary person. Everybody knew him. There was the, and there was such a diversity of opinions regarding his identity. Recently, King Herod had had John the Baptist executed. Now John was an extra, extraordinary man. Thousands had flocked to the wilderness to hear him preach and be baptised, and people regarded him as a great prophet. So some thought Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead. Then again, it was common knowledge among the Jews that the prophet Elijah, who 800 or so years before had been taken to heaven in a whirlwind, would come again. Malachi had prophesied, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. So many, sa so many said that Jesus was Elijah. Jeremiah was also another prophet that they thought may have been Jesus. It was easy to answer his question, Whom do men say that I, the son of, Ma the son of man, am? For there was such a diversity of opinion. We see the influence of public opinion. The Lord was teaching his disciples that it is not possible to arrive at the truth by consulting public opinion. The majority may be right some of the time, but they are certainly not right all the time. And when it comes to spiritual matters, they are never right. We are living in a world that does not allow its people to think for themselves. Besides all the noise and the clamour that makes it practically impossible to meditate and think, the media wields tremendous influence over the minds of the masses. Public opinion is being manipulated by what the newspapers, the radio and the television says. Even the lyrics of songs that are sung influence the thinking of people, especially the young. I used to do, one of my previous jobs was, I used to deal with data protection, which talks about um, personal information, how to keep it secure, etc. And I always used to, in a part of the training course I, I used to provide, I used to mention the fact that we do believe what we see in the papers because we expect the people to be telling us the truth all the time, whether they be the government, whether they be um, royalty, whether it be people in high standing, 
if we read something in the newspaper, it must be true because it's in black and white. But we know, especially what's been going on lately, we, we know that's not the case. And the influence that the press and the media has on society and us as, as an individual, as a family, as a country, is, is immense. We, we just have to follow. And sometimes people just follow what is being said. So even sometimes when things are absolutely ridiculous, people will be taken back by it. Because the media are only concerned with selling news. Often if they can't, cannot get to the truth, they'll invent it. And the way that the news is reported is geared up to make you think what they want you to believe. Sincere men and women who have dared to stand up against the establishment have been slandered, held up to ridicule, and even ostracized by bad press. It is not surprising for the Lord Jesus warned that the road that leads to destruction is very broad and thickly populated. Jesus said that the majority will miss the right path which leads to heaven because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life and few there be that find it. It may be good to know what people think about Christ, but don't let what they think influence you. The majority are confused because they are not that concerned. But the question, but whom say ye that I am? Having asked, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? The Lord Jesus fired his broadside and asked, but whom say ye that I am? To his disciples. It is an extremely personal question because it makes everyone personally accountable to God. This question cannot be avoided. It is one which has to be faced. It is a question which determines which side and whose side we are on. It is impossible to sit on the fence. It is a matter of either and or. Jesus is either who he claims to be or he is a fake. If he is not who he said he is, the Jews were justified in having him crucified as a blasphemer. Jesus said, he that is not for me is against me. It settles once and for all whether we truly believe or simply have a kind of vague religious attitude. This is the most, most important of all personal questions because the answer will personally affect each and every individual, not for time, but also for eternity. Without hesitation, Peter spoke up for everyone and replied, Thou art the Christ the Son of the Living God. Peter's eyes had been opened to the truth. He had heard the words of Jesus, and Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. People had received the words of Jesus with faith, and God revealed to him the truth concerning his Son. And God will do the same for everyone who will receive the words of Jesus and believe them. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Our Lord's response to Peter was, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Then Jesus said to him, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock is a symbol of God in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, 3, sorry, Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, he is the rock, and work is perfect. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. And verse 31, For who is God save the Lord, or who is a rock save our God? There are two Greek words Matthew used. They are Petros and Petra. Petros means stone, and Petra means large rock. Jesus said, Thou art Peter, which is Petros, a stone, and upon this rock, Petra, a large rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Here in Caesarea Philippi, in the sight of the temple devoted to Caesar Augustus, and amongst all the other religions of the day, Jesus declared, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The rock is Christ. He is the foundation and the chief cornerstone upon which all believers, the living stones, are built. The literal meaning of the word church is a called out assembly. The church is not a building, neither is it limited to any particular Christian denomination. It is universal. 
Christ's church is made up of living stones, people who love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, sinners who have been saved by grace through faith in Christ. The church is not fragmented, it is perfectly united. Furthermore, whilst it may seem the churches and chapels are in decline, the church of Jesus Christ is growing and is victorious. To, a, to be a member of Christ's church, one needs to be able to answer sincerely with conviction his personal question with a resounding, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That confession is not mere words, but it is a declaration of personal faith and commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The church is the alternative society. One either belongs to the world or the church. It is impossible to belong to both at the same time. Christians are in the world, but are not of it. The world is under the wrath and judgment of God, but the church is appointed to eternal salvation. And our membership to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ depends on how we answer this question. Many will say to Christ on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, we've done this and that in your name. And Christ will say, depart from me, I never knew you. For their confession was mere outward profession. May we truly respond to his love and his mercy and surrender our lives completely and unreservedly to him. For he is the Christ, God's anointed one, the son of the living God. I trust that God will add his blessing to these few thoughts to you and that we will all understand and we will accept the fact who he is, not who he was, but who he is, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen.